We have with us this morning Tom Cole. Tom was one of the first people in NCS. NCS was started in um, New Canaan, Connecticut, which is where we get our name. One of the early chapters, besides uh, northern New Jersey, was Manhattan. And Tom has been very, very involved in the Manhattan chapter, and we're glad to have you. Welcome. Good to see you guys. Welcome. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. I, I got involved with New Canaan Society in 2008 when we launched the Manhattan chapter. And uh, so in 15 years, I think I've probably heard 450 guys get up and tell their story. And I love that NCS is about story. The DNA of NCS is story. And this is the 20th chapter, I think, that I visited throughout the years. And uh, I think I was here about 10 years ago. And uh, congratulations, you guys are the best chapter, definitely for breakfast. Um, and uh, so that takes a lot of pressure off me. If nothing else, I know you got a really good breakfast. So uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for getting up. Great to see the fellowship at the table. Chick-fil-A uh, has a training video that uh, I watched that had a real powerful effect on me. And it's a simple video, and if you watched it, it might not have the same effect on you. But it's a three-minute video, and it's titled, Every Life Has a Story. And in the video, they bring a camera into one of their restaurants and they start zooming in on people, some of the workers, some of the people behind the counter, some of the people waiting in line, some of the people at the tables. And when they zoom in, some words appear to tell you what's going on in that person's life at the moment. And some of those stories are amazing, wonderful stories. Like they zoom in on a, on a girl and she said, just became a US citizen. Zoom in on another person just got into the college of their dreams. Zoom in on an older guy who's with his wife, and it says, been battling cancer for five years and just got a clean bill of health. But on the other side of the coin, uh, that camera also zoomed in with some challenges, um, like zooming in on an older lady sitting alone at a table that said, today would have been her 50th wedding anniversary, but her husband died 30 days ago. Zoom in on another woman with young kids and it says, single mom, struggling to make ends meet. And zoom in on this little girl who's probably eight or nine years old with a big smile on her face. And it said, mom died at birth and dad blames her. And then at the end of the video, it says, every life has a story if we bother to read it. And I love Chick-fil-A. I love everything they do and everything they stand for. But I take exception to the end of that video because the reason that video had such a powerful impact on me is as I looked at everybody, everybody looked the same. Without those words that appeared, you, it's hard to read people's stories. Right? The only way you really get to know people's stories is to ask them about themselves and get them to tell their story and their real story. And uh, that's what was so powerful to me. And as I look out today from this vantage point and look at all of you, everybody looks the same. Everyone's enjoying fellowship. Everyone's enjoying a meal. But here's what I know. I know that in this room, there are people that are really hurting deeply. And I know in this room, there's people are in an amazing, wonderful season of life. And in the world we live in today, the culture that we live in today, we live in this make-believe culture, particularly driven by social media, where everyone wants to put up a facade and show that everyone's life is perfect. And the reality is, is we know if you can create a safe environment where people can actually tell their story, that life is difficult. I think the, the deepest longing of the human soul, there's two deep longings, which, is, which NCS, the DNA of NCS, Jim Lane was brilliant with the way he, 
he came up with this concept. I think the two deepest longings of our soul is to be known and to be loved. And in the society we're in today, you know, to be known is, is to be authentic, transparent, to be able to spill your guts a little bit about what's going on in your life. And that's a little countercultural. People are afraid to do that. And then to be loved. You can't create a safe environment where people can tell their stories if you don't have acceptance, if you're not judgmental. Um, that, that's the, the environment we want to create, an environment filled with grace here. And I, I know that uh, you guys know that. I know that, that this is what has made NCS so special for so many of you. I wish uh, I would have known that uh, this lesson, that life is difficult. Uh, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, a very homogeneous suburb. Uh, diversity was measured whether you were Catholic or Protestant. Um, the Protestants had three kids or less. The Catholics had four kids or more. One family had 14. Um, it was a middle-class suburb. The average home was probably 1,600 square feet with a one-car garage. But life was perfect. I, I, I didn't know anyone that didn't have a mom and dad in the home. And that was my story. I had wonderful parents who were responsible uh, they were rule followers. They had amazing character. They loved each other. Uh, they had been married. They were married 55 years when my dad passed away. A very safe, secure environment, and that—that's what I grew up in. And uh, in high school, I was going to go out for the basketball team, and through uh, what can only be described as a miracle, uh, at the last minute, I decided to go out for the swim team, even though our high school didn't have a pool. Uh, and 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 I had never I had never swum competitively and, and and back in the day you know anyone that was going out for the team started swimming at the age of six so um, swimming became a really big part of my life through high school I got a lot of affirmation because uh, I was gifted with an ability to do that and went on to do it in college so if someone was going to tell me at the age of 21 that life is difficult I'm not so sure I would, would have grasped it and comprehended it so. A lot of this is battlefield instruction, but let me uh, maybe touch on a little bit of the, some of the challenges that I've experienced in my life that might uh, resonate one or two of them with you. I mean, my, my hope and prayer today is that there's one thing I say that might uh, impact how you view life, your relationship with Jesus, and your relationship with other people. But the first year out of college, I... I, I, in college, I lived in a fraternity with 100 guys and was on a swim team with 30 other guys. And I moved to Cleveland, Ohio, where I knew nobody, and I lived in a one-bedroom apartment by myself, and I had a job that I didn't really enjoy, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I got 40 more years left of this misery. Um, I was miserable. I had dated a girl on and off more off than on uh, through college, and, and when you're lo lonely and living in Cleveland, Ohio, marriage looks pretty good. So uh, I got engaged, got married, and at the age of 24, I moved to Chicago. Uh, I started a new job and a new career. I had my first child, went from two incomes to one income, bought my first house, had a two and a half hour commute round trip uh, every day, and started night school at University of Chicago to get my MBA. And I was on overload. I had no margin in my life. I went from working out four hours a day in college to not having a minute to exercise. And, and life was, was really, really hard. And I measured my success as a husband and a father by how hard I was working and how well I was providing. And I, I, I was working very hard. That, I, for, for those of you that don't know, that's an awful measuring stick to measure your success as a husband and father. But I thought I was, you know, Superman. And um, fast forward, I was 31, we got transferred to London, 33 transferred back to Chicago. So those moves were uh, challenging and st stressful in their own right. Uh, at the age of 40, I got uh, transferred to New York from Chicago. And we decided as a family that it'd be least disruptive if I commuted which commuting every week from Chicago to New York, uh, in hindsight, was not a good idea. But I did that for seven years, uh, you know, four days a week in New York, Monday to Thursday. Uh, right after I got transferred, 
Uh, my building was right across the street from the World Trade Center. It got wiped out. Um, and just being in New York for 9-11. At the age of 42, uh, my wife filed for divorce. We had had a, a challenging marriage, lots of ups and downs. Interestingly, uh, the challenges of my marriage grew my faith, drew me to Jesus, got me to start thinking about uh, my mindset of measuring my success as a husband and father totally transformed. And I was like, what, what can I do to be a better husband? What can I do to be a better father? And certainly I fell short uh, on, on the metrics there. But I grew closer to Jesus, and I became a better husband and father. And my wife would say something like, you're a great guy. I just don't love you. So that's, that's what our marriage looked like. Uh, and then, you know, she filed for divorce when I was 42. When I was 47, my dad died. Uh, when I was 55, I, or 54, I had my first heart attack. When I was 55, my son had open heart surgery. When I was 57, I had my second heart attack. And then just in the last two years, two years ago, I decided to step away. When I was turning 60, I, I looked at life and I said, you know, what's really important here? Uh, how important is my job? There's maybe other things to do. So I stepped away from a career that I loved and enjoyed. And uh, that was a hard decision, but the right decision. Uh, my mom passed away shortly thereafter. Uh, I got in an awful Uber car accident. Buckle up if you're riding in that Uber. I was in the hospital with, uh, with internal bleeding. Three of my close friends passed away. In addition, a guy I swam with at Indiana who uh, had a, a, a car restoration business here in Nashville committed suicide, Mark Lambert. Uh, and my mother-in-law uh, was struggling with Alzheimer's and eventually passed away. So I don't mean to be a downer, but, you know, if someone would have told me at 21, you know, here are the things you'd experience, I wouldn't have believed them. But the reality is life is difficult. And as I take a step back and I think about my faith journey and I think about my personal growth, most of it happened in the time of adversity. Isn't it interesting um, I think Rick Warren said a quote that uh, so, sooner or later you realize God is all you need uh, when God is all you got. And when you hit these bumps in the road and you realize I'm not in control of this stuff, this is part of God's story, and how do I respond to adversity? Um, personal growth happens. I went through uh, a halftime program that Bob Buford uh, started and one of the guys that started with him wrote a book called Out of the Blue. His name's Greg Murtha. When he was dying of cancer, it was published just a couple weeks after he died, after a five-year battle with cancer. And listen to what he says. He says, cancer has sculpted me into someone who understands more deeply, hurts more often, appreciates more quickly, cries more easily, hopes more desperately, loves more openly, and lives more passionately. And you know, Tim Keller, obviously, who passed away last week, he, I, I was reading some of his quotes. He was on our board of directors and would be a regular speaker in Manhattan. Wonderful that I got to know him. And I saw a quote that he had said about how his prayer life, as a result of his cancer, went to a whole new level that he would never want to go back to had cancer not entered into his life. So. That gives me at least a little bit of encouragement when life's troubles come my way. The other thing I think about when I think about my adversity is uh, God uses that as a way to show the impurities and imperfections in our own heart, the idols that might be in our life, the things that we put ahead of God. And, uh, and so um, I, I think about that regularly is what are those impurities when things aren't really going the way I'd like them to do. The other thing is adversity is oftentimes a catalyst for greatness. Um, there's a nonprofit in Chicago called Young Hearts for Life. And uh, it was started by a couple families and a doctor. The, the families had lost their children to sudden cardiac arrest. Sudden cardiac arrest is when you see someone playing a sport on a field and drops dead uh, when they're in high school, there's, there's no symptoms 
it just causes death. But what's interesting is it's easily detectable with a simple EKG. So those families that lost kids got together and said, we need to get EKGs in the high school so the kids can all get tested. My son was tested and he was diagnosed with a very severe heart issue that could cause, would have caused sudden cardiac arrest. I'm convinced that my son is alive today because a couple of families and a doctor said, let's hope that we can do something so that the tragedy that we've all experienced isn't replicated in the lives of other families. So as we go through these, it's, it's no surprise that I, you know, I went through this divorce and, um, and I get a lot of phone calls from guys who say, you know, my wife just filed for divorce. I have no idea what to do. Someone told me to call you. And what a privilege it is. And then finally, uh, the lesson, God redeems brokenness. You know, my, I've been married almost 18 years now to Kim. Uh, we met uh, six months, believe it or not, after uh, my wife filed for divorce, which was too early, according to all the experts and me. Um, but she's in a, I, I prayed during my first marriage, God, I want my wife to love me, please. And God didn't answer that prayer that way, but he certainly has answered a prayer of bringing an amazing woman into my life. And so to see, I don't think God wastes an ounce of pain, to see redemption in the middle of brokenness, aren't we lucky to be able to serve a God like that and to be loved by a God like that? So I'm uh, 54, having this heart attack. I, I was swimming in the pool, believe it or not. <laughs> I was in great shape. Uh, it was the last thing I would have ever predicted or expected. I was rushed to the hospital in an ambulance. I'm laying on a gurney. They, they basically say, you're having a heart attack. We might have to open you up, sign this paperwork. And I'm laying on the gurney, staring at the ceiling, and I'm gasping for air. And uh, the dominant thought that went through my head and I would have never predicted this either. The dominant thought was you haven't poured enough wisdom yet into the lives of the kids. It's not time yet. I didn't think about, you know, what if I die? I certainly didn't think about, boy, I got all this work left that I got to get done before tomorrow morning. None of that. But uh, the dominant thought, and, and, and that thought was probably because I was largely absent during the most formative years of the kid's life. Like, I never missed any of their events, and I arranged my travel schedule that I was there, and I just rationalized that if I was there Friday through Sunday, you know, that, that's all I would see them anyways, because I usually left home before they woke up and oftentimes got home after dinner. So, you know, I, I blew it. That's one. You have to, I don't believe in you know, having a lot of regrets and rethinking the past because we can't go back and change it. But it's no surprise that that was probably the dominant thought. So I started getting more intentional about sending the kids stuff, whether it was a sermon, a TED Talk, an article, a quote. And you know, they're in their 20s, and, and I'm getting the sense that they're probably you know, not reading every thing I'm sending. I don't know if you can relate that or not. Um, so I decided, uh, I decided the first thing in retirement to write this book. Um, and uh, it's called The Narrow Gate. And why did I title it The Narrow Gate? And it does, has nothing to I got a wonderful email from a woman, uh, Abby Williams, who works at The Narrow Gate. I don't know if her dad is here. Is her dad here? He was going to come, so shame on him for not coming. <laughs> but uh, she runs something called The Narrow Gate, or she's on the staff at The Narrow Gate in, in Nashville. Um, but my goal was my kids are, I would dis define them as seekers. You know, they're not going to church every Sunday, unfortunately. And so I wanted to do is write down what do I think is most important in my life and what do I want them to know? And I don't know if you ever contemplated that question. Like what, if you had to just leave to your kids, here's the one thing I really want you to know. Here's what's most important in life. And what I wanted to do given their perspective, their faith perspective, is to try to marry secular with, with uh, sacred, marry scripture with what people's uh, lives have demonstrated. So I, um, I uh, look, Jesus gave us the answer to the test, right? Thank God, Matthew 22, you know, when he was asked, what's the most important thing I need to know? Uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is like it, 
other translations are equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so I started just saying, you know, that's the answer, uh, that we should love each other well. And so I, I, I'm like, okay, I got I to gotta just look around. And guess what? It was pretty easy to find lots of examples. So uh, there's a Harvard study. I don't know if you've, maybe you've seen a TED Talk by a guy named Robert Waldinger. But it's pretty fascinating. Harvard did a study that started in 1938. They took over 700 19-year-old young men. Half of them were sophomores at Harvard. Half of them were from Boston's toughest, poorest neighborhoods. And they studied their lives for their entire life. Annual interviews, physicals, and, and in deep analysis. And the, the conclusion of that study is, and they asked everyone in the study, what do you think you will find is going to make you happy uh, in life and healthy? What's going to make you happy and healthy in life? And everyone said fame and fortune would make me happy uh, in life and healthy. Well, the reality is, is they looked at the people that were in their 80s and looked back at all the results from this. The number one determinant, the number one determinant of happiness and health in life is the depth and quality of people's relationships at the age of 50. It didn't matter your economic position. It didn't matter your diet, your genetics. The people that lived the longest were the happiest and healthiest are the ones that had deep personal relationships at the age of 50. What did Warren Buffett say? Warren Buffett said, when you get to my age, you'll measure success by how many of the people that you want to love you actually do love you. And he says, the problem with love is you can't buy it. You can buy sex, but you can't buy love. And the only way to get love is be lovable. David Brooks, happiness is found amongst thick and loving relationships. Um, getting rid of self-sufficiency for a state of mutual dependence. That's countercultural, right? The cultural message is go it alone. Don't rely on other people. Uh, the book Tuesdays with Maury, uh, Atheist David Foster Wallace, Nelson Mandela, all of them. The way you find enjoyment in life. Talk to anyone who's towards the end of their life. What's the most important thing? What's your greatest accomplishment? Very few people talk about work. Most people talk about the impact they've had on the lives of others, the relationships they've had with those closest to them. Or on the converse side of that, that's people's greatest regret, usually, is that I wish I would have spent more time in relationship. So that was the punchline. Fortunately, that uh, was uh, in total alignment with Jesus' message. And that's totally in alignment with the tagline of NCS, right? Friendship with Jesus and friendship with each other. And when Jesus talks about love, you know, we got to be careful. The cultural message thinks that love is, is the bachelor, that love is tender, um, that love is the feeling. And he's really talking about love, the doing, the serving, the sacrificing. You know, the messy stuff, the unpopular stuff. And, and, and the reason the name of the book is The Narrow Gate is because the message I wanted to give my kids is the easy path isn't going to lead to your best life. You know, you got to do the hard things. And so um, the bad news is to do that, we don't, we don't naturally love well. We don't naturally sacrifice and suppress our own needs and desires so that we can help and benefit another person. We need transformation. And that's the message of Jesus. One of my favorite verses is Romans 12 too. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think, right? Um, my formula, one of my formulas for transformation is I think transformation happens. This, this is hopefully one reason you guys are all here. When we interpret everyday life, what's really going on in your life right now, through the lens of Scripture, what does Scripture say I should do to respond to the circumstances I'm in the middle of today in community with other people? I think you need all three. You need authenticity. You need transparency. Here's what's really happening in my life. You need a plumb line. You need a true north. You need instruction as to how to live your life. 
And this stuff's hard, so you need community. You need guys to come around you and encourage you and lift you up. So many, as I think of some of the relationships I had early in my life before I really became a believer, you know, we would, guys would get together and we'd drag each other down to a lowest common denominator. And how great is it to have guys in your life that are calling you up to be the man that God has designed you to be? So as I think of Romans 12 too, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. You know, I, I in my career was on Wall Street, obviously, uh, you know, high pressure uh, environment. It's not as bad as people think, but certainly there's greed around that causes people to behave a certain way. And uh, I never made money my motivation, I'm proud to say that, probably because I was more naive, but many people do. And there was a Princeton study that showed that your incremental happiness, once you can pay food, shelter, and clothing, doesn't go up. People that can barely make ends meet are as happy as people that are making tens of millions of dollars a year. So there's no marginal return on happiness. As you think of achievement, my three athletes that you guys can all think about, Michael Phelps, the greatest Olympian of all time, Tom Brady, greatest football player of all time, Tiger Woods, arguably the greatest golfer of all time. They all achieved amazing things, and they're all completely dissatisfied. And look at Steve Jobs, the guy who revolutionized the world as we know it today, billionaire, read about him uh, towards the end of his life. He was a miserable soul because he didn't have those relationships. You know, They don't have a relationship with Jesus and a relationship with each other. Second thing to think about is what's, what are our competing interests? What's, what's pulling at us away from loving our neighbor well? And you know, there's a battle that rages inside of you of good and evil. And, and we all can, those of us that have been in the faith for a while, talk about the fruits of the Spirit. You know, when you accept Jesus Christ into your life, you get the power of the Holy Spirit, which is amazing, and the fruit of the Spirit, which is kindness, gentleness, love, joy, peace. We oftentimes ignore or don't talk enough about the verses right before the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians that talk about our sin nature, and our sin nature doesn't go away. Um, I'm going to give you a quote that uh, Henry Cloud wrote, which I think is interesting and I think also validates a little bit of what NCS is trying to do. He says, it's interesting to compare a legalistic church with a good AA meeting. In the church, it is culturally unacceptable to have problems. That is called being sinful. In the AA meeting, it is culturally unacceptable to be perfect. That is called denial. In one setting, people look better but get worse. And in the other, they look worse but get better. And uh, that's what, you know, we have to be honest with each other, guys. There's, if I, I always say to guys, if we could create an environment where we talked about our temptations, we'd have fewer train wrecks to talk about in the lives of guys. I think, you know, as I've had a front row seat into so many guys' lives by being a leader within NCS, and it's, it's, it's a privilege to be invited into that hallowed ground. And it's amazing how many mistakes guys have made because they've made decisions based on desire and emotion and not based on logic and truth. So we need to make good decisions and then the other part, we got our sinful nature here, and then there's shame. I can't tell you how many guys battle shame every day. You know, shame is the voice inside of you that said, if people really knew your story, they wouldn't like you. Or that says, you know, you're not good, fill in the blank. You're not good enough. You're not rich enough. You're not successful enough. You're not perfect enough. It's that voice inside of you that keeps you from having authentic transparent relationships. And so I think what I love about NCS is, you know, we can surround ourselves with other guys and hopefully surround ourselves with guys that can be an encouragement and build us up and lift us up. And I encourage each of you to do that. I think uh, friendship is probably one of the most misunderstood concepts in the world today. I was clueless about friendship. If you'd have asked me when I was 35, Tom, did you have a lot of friends? And I would say yes. 
because I kept in touch with a lot of people. I had a lot of buddies. But did people really know my hopes, my dreams, my hurts, my sorrows, my temptations, my frustrations? Were people asking me and, and have a good understanding if my values were in alignment with my behavior? Did I share my checkbook with people and my calendar to hold me accountable? And you know, I think friendship, social media again, has neutered the concept of friendship. There's nothing more beautiful. And I think they're, they're, the one word that I'm going to leave you with on, on friendship is intentionality. Because when guys get together like this, and I hope this isn't the case, but it's easy to talk about the NBA Finals or the latest golf tournament or your latest golf game and not get deep and talk about the real issues in life. And I have found that if you're not intentional about it, you, t you typically don't go there until the crisis is so bad that you have to talk about it. And so that's why we promote energy groups within the NCS. So I've got a group that we've been meeting now for three years every Tuesday morning. Uh, my college roommates and I get together once a month. The, the sole purpose, college roommates and I, when we get together, the sole purpose is we each get 15 minutes to talk about life. And each of us are questioning, prodding, encouraging. And uh, I really encourage you to do that. It, it, it takes courage to be that open and vulnerable, but it's really, really important. And then the last point uh, that I'll wrap with is uh, I think it's important to live in the moment. I do think, a, you know, people said, what's NCS? And, and one of the description was it's a combination of young life for adults. So we try to have fun and laugh and, 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 and create a, a place that anyone of any faith background would feel comfortable in, uh, combined with the authenticity of AA. And I think AA gets it right of, you know, one, one day at a time. Um, there's a book, The Power of Now. There's a lot of discussion around mental health that I've jumped into in retirement and I'm working a lot with college and, and people in their 20s. Um, here's a quote from The Power of Now. Unease, anxiety, tension, stress, worry, all forms of fear are caused by too much future and not enough presence. Guilt, regret, resentment, grievances, sadness, bitterness, and all forms of non-forgiveness are caused by too much past and not enough presence. And I think it's important that we do unpack our past, that we understand how our past influences how we view the world today. We all have a biased view of the world in part based on our past, and I, I think it's important that we do that. When I think about... Um, my marriage, uh, my first marriage that ended, uh, I had a pastor that walked alongside of me, a good friend of mine, friend and pastor. It's great when your friend is your pastor. And he discipled me and called me every day for six months. And uh, I spilled my guts to him, and he poured truth and scripture and practical advice into me. And he said, one of the things you got to do is forgive those that are involved in this. And I can't tell you how many times I have read the scripture, love your enemy, um, love those that persecute you. Those, those were just words on the page until they changed to love the woman who's blowing up your marriage and will take half your net worth. That's who you're supposed to love. And uh, he said, you don't have to like her, but you got to love her. And uh, that was not easy to do. And my first step of forgiveness was, yeah, I, I got that. I, I forgive you. But there was a tagline in the back of my head. I would say, I forgive you. And in the back of my head is, I hope she has a miserable life. That, that's not forgiveness, guys. But, you know, I was like, oh, I heard she's not doing so well. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, but as I was discipled, it's amazing how certain parts of scripture you just forget, which is why we got to come to the word over and over again. You know, oftentimes, Luke, Romans, it talks about pray for those who persecute you. So it wasn't until I started praying that God would actually bless my ex-wife that forgiveness became real. My heart softened 
my heart softened, and I, I got to see suddenly a mirror was standing right in front of me, and God showed me all the things I did wrong as a husband in that marriage. So she got the headline because she filed for divorce, but it became very clear to me that, you know, I needed to ask for forgiveness, and, and I needed to forgive her, and it's, there's incredible freedom in that. And then I do think we need a plan for the future. It says God laughs when we make plans, but as part of this halftime thing, uh, it says, what are the five things you want someone to say about you at your 80th birthday party? And that's the polite way of saying, what are the five things you want someone to say about you at your funeral? And, and as I was turning 60, I, I, I thought about that. I wrote it down. And my five are follower of Jesus, loving and faithful husband, respected and admired father and grandfather, loyal friend, and someone who helped others in need. And what didn't make the list was he was a good banker or he was a good swimmer. And so we really need to have a vision of a destination where we would like to go, recognizing that every day is a gift. And then use that vision to prioritize to answer the question, why are you here today? Why are you going to do what you're going to do today? And oftentimes you can't ask the why, and oftentimes you need to ask that why question three or four times because there's multiple layers as to the whys. And so uh, that's my encouragement today is um, God is good. God redeems brokenness. Pain shared is divided, and joy shared is multiplied. And so being in community with common men who have a common value and understand the love of Jesus Christ. He loves everyone in this room exactly the same. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you believe. And that was a hard concept for me to rack my head around until I had children. God loves all of you exactly the same. And for some of you, it might be time to turn towards him. When, when times get tough, people either run away from God or they run to God. So my encouragement to you today, fellas, is run to God in community with other men. God bless. Thank you, Tom. There was so much you said that I related to. I'll just give you one. Monday, I was with my son, my older son, and his oldest daughter, and he was explaining how that when he was growing up, I was never there, not there. He said, when I, my son left home and went to Chicago, I made sure that he had the 800 number at my company because he could find me there at 7 in the morning and he could find me there at 9 o'clock at night using the 800 number, not calling home. But what I've learned is that whatever I messed up, now's the time, whatever now is, now's the time to change. You can still build relationships. I can build a relationship with my son, even though he's in his 50s, that maybe I didn't build when he was in his teens. Have a great week. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. Yeah.